Okay, uh, our next presentation is uh, Matt Angle, and it's a microwave-based in vivo neural recording platform with up to 65,536 channels. Yeah, it's like uh, my dish network uh, for my TV. Thanks for sticking it out, all of you. I know we're getting late in the conference. Um, today I want to talk to you about uh, a little bit about the work that we've been doing. Uh, Paradromics is a company that I uh, founded in 2015, and it has a goal of building a high bandwidth brain machine interface, taking it through clinical trials, and then bringing it into market as a medical device platform. And uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us, but I want to talk to you today about one of the important steps along that path, which is uh, high bandwidth uh, neural interfacing. This is our Argo system. Uh, it's about as big as this water bottle. So first of all, it's not a brain implant. It's used for uh, animal trials, and it sits outside of the brain. And then these, uh, these electrodes here that I've, that I've circled in, uh, are able to insert into the brain and then record action potentials extracellularly. So this is, a, uh, this is a research tool that we've been developing to prove out our core technology. And uh, it's a research tool of a scale that's pretty unprecedented. I think to date the uh, world record for recording neurons simultaneously is 700 set by the NeuroPixel group, which is a joint venture between uh, Genelia Farm Research Campus, uh, HHMI, and uh, uh, IMEC, and then uh, UCL and Wellcome Trust in the, in the UK. And uh, we're looking at being able to record from tens of thousands of neurons using our system, and we're, we're very excited about what we've built. Um, the system is meant to be deployed in both small animals, uh, rodents, and large animals, uh, such as sheep or pigs. And uh, today I'm going to walk you through kind of end-to-end -end what, what kind of system you need to record from tens of thousands of neurons. And, uh, and then write all of that activity to disk and then visualize it and uh, give you a sense of what the engineering effort was to build this first system. Uh, so first I'll start out with the business end of the system, which are the microwires that insert into the brain. Um, I really like microwires. They've been around for a long time, something like they've been used constantly for 60 years. And, uh, it's old, but that's what makes it really good from a translational perspective, because we really understand how they work. Uh, we know they last a long time. We know what ways that they can break and what ways that they can foul. And then uh, the field has even continued to advance. Uh, groups like Cynthia Chestix, uh, Takashi Kozai's have been uh, pushing for smaller and smaller wires that can be less invasive when inserted into the brain. Uh, so it's kind of a old but good way of recording signals in the brain. And one of the things that we as a company have been focusing on a lot is uh, in my graduate school days, I had to hand etch uh, tungst sharp tungsten wires to be able to insert into the brain. And every one of these wires took a long damn time for me to make. And then they had to be individually connected to uh, recording amplifiers and then like the the sort of throughput was related to how many hours I put in. Um, obviously, when we want to scale this up to tens of thousands of wires, we need a way to sharpen lots of wires uh, in a very reproducible way, uh, which is what you see here, and then a way to assemble them into uh, large spaced arrays so that they can be inserted into the brain uh, while causing minimum damage. And this is kind of part of our early core technology that we developed. Just uh, as a little point of comparison, many of you may be familiar with the Utah Ray, which is the state of the art in uh, human neural interfacing right now and has allowed tetraplegic patients to control kind of crude motor prosthetics and to even uh, type out messages uh, directly on a computer. And this is an example of one of our microwire bundles that's taking up the same amount of real estate as the Utah Ray. So the Utah Ray is 100 electrodes. In the same uh, amount of area, we can fit 1,500 electrodes. So that's a factor of 15 more uh, electrodes per unit area. But it goes a little bit deeper than that because the wires themselves are less than 20 microns in diameter. Uh, they can't, they're much less invasive than many other silicon probes. And uh, part of this is related to the uh, mesh size of the neurovasculature. 
So you can think of inserting into the brain a little bit like the sort of old quilted blankets that your grandmother might have made. Um, you can insert, it, you know, if your, your fingers can insert through, but if you try to push uh, like a telephone pole through, you would just rip it. And uh, it's a very similar, very similar issue with inserting uh, into the vasculature of the brain. And I'll just show an example of a 20 micron wire being inserted through. And then I'll tell you that, um, Here you can see uh, a wire that's coated in fluorescent dye being the green inserted through the, uh, uh, the vasculature of the brain where the, uh, blood, the blood is dyed red. Um, if I had tried to push through something considerably larger, let's say like an 80 micron wire, uh, you would just see all red right now because you would uh, break a blood vessel and cause a bleed. And so the size really matters uh, in microelectrodes. And that both has an effect on the chronic performance of the device, and it also has an effect on the amount of data that you can get out. Because the fewer neurons you kill when you insert your device, the more neurons you have to listen to. So that's, again, a single wire can record for more neurons, and it can increase the information transfer rate by a factor of, say, five. So now we have these large devices, these large arrays of wires that you can insert into the brain, but in order to uh, use those practically, you have to connect them to electronics. Uh, when you scale up to thousands of wires, it's no longer practical to hand solder every wire. So one of the things that we developed was a way to press these bundles of wires onto uh, sensor arrays in a way that uh, every pixel in the array is coded, is uh, topped off with a metal bond pad, and wherever the wires land on a bond pad, now you can read out the voltage on that wire. And so we've come up with ways of, with really high fidelity, uh, bonding bundles of 10, 20,000 wires to uh, large format, uh, effectively image sensor chips that are able to read out voltages on each of the wires. When we got started in this endeavor, we weren't really satisfied with the sensor arrays that were available uh, to be used. It really had to do with throughput. Um, there, are, there are a lot of uh, CMOS microelectrode arrays out there today, but uh, you can only read out a few hundred or maybe a thousand of them simultaneously. We wanted to be able to read out all 65,000 channels at 40,000 frames per second uh, with really low noise and just nothing like that existed. Uh, so we found a partner that worked in the uh, building sensors for uh, high energy uh, physics and uh, particle detection that had taken on challenges like this before. And together we made a state-of-the-art uh, CMOS neural sensor for connecting to the bundles. When you have a sensor that's recording from 65,000 channels, at 40,000 frames per second, you have a lot of data. It's something like 30 gigabits per second that it produces. And so you need to build, uh, the backend electronics have to be a little bit sophisticated. And what, what we had to build was effectively a high-speed camera of the same type that's used to uh, film bullets mid-flight. A lot of those cameras just store locally to like a small like memory cache and can't store for very long. We had. To, we had the added challenge that we needed to be able to record for hours, so um, potentially acquire terab stream terabytes of data to disk. And so for this, we had to develop our own effectively high-speed camera system that would connect to that CMOS device. Um, I don't think the details are that important. Suffice to say that it uh, exports the data over a 40 gig uh, optical link and is galvanically isolated, which is very useful in a lot of neurophysiology. Uh, cases. So all of this fits inside of a uh, container that's about the size of a water bottle. It dissipates uh, 20 watts, so uh, this, is not a, this is not a brain implant. It gets pretty hot and it's pretty big. Um, the, on the back end, we need a high performance computer that's able to grab 30 gigabits of data uh, per second and write to disk, and then it, the same computer acts as a server to client PCs so that um, different users can come on and see what's, what's going on while the experiment's in progress. 
And um, so this allows for real-time visualization, uh, effectively turns our system into a 65,000 channel digital oscilloscope. And there are a lot of really interesting uh, real-time visualization uh, things that we're looking to roll out in the future, but at the moment we just have a 65,000 channel oscilloscope. Um, show you here a little video. Uh, our end game is to build a brain implant. So I just wanted to kind of explode the current system that we're using, and I'll say that all of the electronics in the boards can really be put into a single ASIC. Uh, and the microwires themselves are only a few millimeters long and could easily be uh, bonded to that ASIC. And I think that there are existing hermetic encapsulation strategies uh, that would allow us to make this whole thing implantable. So one of the big challenges moving from what we have now to the implantable version uh, is related to power. And uh, this is the subject for a different talk, but I think one of the places where we've made a lot of progress is coming up with uh, analog signal processing and uh, on-chip feature extraction to allow us to reduce the total amount of data that needs to be digitized and transmitted and reduce the power budget for our system uh, by a factor of about 100. I wanted to quickly, to kind of motivate, I've been saying high, high bandwidth, getting a lot of data through high channel count. Um, to, to motivate why that's important, I wanted to bring things back to the BrainGate program and the most successful uh, examples to date of intracortical implants uh, and BCI. So this is, an, this is an example of a woman that's, able, that's uh, been able to type at a rate of about eight words per minute uh, using a computer interface and a Utah array. Uh, she effectively moves, moves a cursor on the screen and clicks out the letters that she's looking for. To put that in context of other ways that we communicate and, and options for people with disabilities, um, eight words per minute, uh, sort of uh, conventional uh, gaze tracking software can maybe do 20 words per minute. The current state of the art in BMI is about 30 words per minute using uh, an ECOG array that covered a quite large area. Uh, we speak at around 100 to 120 words per minute. And uh, stenography keyboard can, uh, the best typist can type around 350 to 400 words per minute. We're looking right now at being able to increase data throughput versus the Utah array, a factor of about 50. And so, if we, if we think that words per minute is roughly linearly uh, related to the amount of data that we can push through the interface, then we're looking at being able to go from quite slow to uh, the fastest form of communication that exists for people. And um, I would say that there's a lot, you can go a lot further um, using more modules, uh, using better electrodes even than what we're using right now and it's, uh, it's reasonable to think that brain-machine interfaces will quickly be faster than you can reasonably think of things to communicate and uh, not be a bandwidth, not be sort of the limiting factor for communication. Uh, with that, I'd just like to put up a picture of the team uh, and also sort of thank our collaborators that we work with and thank our sponsors. Uh, particularly the NIH and, and DARPA. And thank you guys for attending. Fantastic science. Uh, the micro arrays or the micro wires, uh, it looks like they're all sort of the same length. Having that much density, but having it all in one planar, I guess you could change that, but uh, you know, is that at some point is the having additional density still beneficial if you're looking at two neurons right next to each other? Has that been proven to be I advantageous? Think, I think that when you start getting closer than, let's say, 80 microns, you start uh, oversampling in that layer. Mm -hmm. um, but up until the limit where you've recorded every neuron in the layer, um, higher density is better. Do we know that? Um, I mean, I saw that DARPA footage of the chimp 
that was working using a robotic arm and feeding himself and then use a robotic arm to unstrap his own arm. It was like a three-arm chip. Have you seen that stuff? That, yeah, uh, I think it, it relates to... It their relates, density was one thousandth of what you've got. It relates to task complexity. Um, and if you have like, sure. Yeah, if you have very stereotype movements and the animal trains on those. I mean, to some extent, you could think of like, even like the way that like Tiger Woods swings a golf club. You'd think that involves like a lot of... Uh, that's engaging a lot of control. But mm -hmm. like, if he swings it the same way every time, you might only need like one neuron to swing a golf club. Sure, if it's all it's laminated. At the same sure. time, if you're asking laminated. someone to feed themselves and sign their name and catch a ball, okay. uh, once the range of possible movements increases, the uh, bandwidth that's required to control across that whole space increases as well. Okay, and if you're going to actually make it implantable, why do you need the microwire array? Why couldn't you just have that placard of CMOS sensors and parallel processors? On the surface of the brain, you don't have access to uh, action potential data, uh, which is like more granular, sort of better data to get. Um, okay. And you only have, it's, I would liken it to sitting a few blocks away from a football stadium. Mm -hmm. um, you can have, you could put down really high density array of microphones two blocks away from a football stadium, but you won't hear the voices in the stadium. You'll, um, you'll know maybe like if someone like scored a touchdown, you might even be able to use machine learning to tell like which side scored, but you're never gonna be able to back out the individual people as opposed to dropping microphones into the bleachers. All right, good analogy. Uh, any questions? Yeah, please. Matt, great talk. I'm curious to hear more about your uh, clinical applications. It looks like you're focused primarily on communication aids. Have you thought about uh, prosthetic applications as well or control of robotic exoskeletons? We've thought about that, but I think for the, I think for the first indication, um, the people that would benefit the, the most uh, from a brain machine interface and would be the most, uh, say, eager um, to be part of this would be people that have severe combined speech and motor deficits. Um, people who, for whom even just communicating with their loved ones is very belabored due to the low communication rates that are afforded them right now. Okay, and then in that case, is, is the goal to target speech areas of motor cortex, or are you planning on targeting uh, arm areas like the Chinoy group and others have done and uh, controlling a speller rather than an actual, you know, Phil Kennedy-style approach? I think that's still like an open question. I mean, because you can go into, you can go into auditory areas like the STG and decode sure. intended speech, but then that has some other implications because that's an area of the brain that's still actively being used by the patient as opposed to like a motor area that is in a lot of I think the Mugler patient. study that you cited was recording from temporal lobe like you're describing, right? Yeah, um, for, but the uh, Chinoy study was uh, in motor cortex. Right, Yeah. okay, very good. So thanks, Matt. Great talk. So I do understand like the BCI or BMI for, for like, you know, stroke patients locked in, you know, these cases. So what is your take on this general communication, like the kernels and the neural links that they just want to increase our speed to communicate with the outside, you know, for healthy. So can you tell me what do you think is their motivation and your take on whether it, this is going to happen or not and how is it going to help us as humans? What it's do you hard, think? Yeah, it's hard to speak to their motivation, but I think if they actually want to do it, they're going to have to go through the FDA and the FDA is going to require a reasonable indication. Um, so I think that as they get more serious, I think their path will look more similar to ours. Um, it seems very difficult to imagine in the United States people undergoing brain surgery electively for this sort of consumer. But do you think we will choose to have an implanted to communicate with our phone on the future? I mean, what is your, I mean, do you think this is going to happen? I wouldn't choose it. Would you choose it? Ray Kurzweil would <laughs> choose it. Yeah. That's the future of humanity. Because we have to merge with yeah, our stuff. I'm actually, it I'm may not look like that, but a 777 doesn't look like the right flyer either. That's true. I, I'm actually surprised when I go to when I go to, to talks and I sort of and I speak with people how many healthy people are excited about uh, brain implants. Um, I think we have to. I mean, I'm excited about brain implants, but I think you have to approach it cautiously because it involves brain surgery, and I think now it does. Yeah, but it may not always. I. I think, I think for the foreseeable future, high data rate will involve brain surgery for some pretty hard physical reasons. 
There are a lot of tubes that run through the brain, a lot of <laughs> hollow spaces in the brain, a lot of interesting ways to get places. It's true, I've seen a lot of- In every medical field that we wouldn't have it's true. fathomed two decades ago. I've seen a lot of those proposals. Um, I think I, my attitude toward a lot of that is the same as when I see like, I don't like diet drugs, like advertised. I'd be as excited as anyone to take a pill that makes me not have to exercise, but I also like, for the foreseeable future, I'm gonna go out and run. Um, in the same way for, as the BCI community, I think it's important that, yeah, everyone like keep focused on the really important uh, work that's ahead of them. Hi, I had a question about um, using these for different populations with communicative problems. And so the problem with locked-in syndrome versus, say, stroke is quite different because in one, the brain tissue is intact, but the sort of motor output is a problem. And for others, the, the problem is that the brain tissue has been damaged. Do you think that these sort of same solutions would work for both of them, or are there different challenges? I think it depends on where the stroke is. So like some locked-in locked in patients, uh, it's due to brainstem stroke. Right, yeah. um, but even stroke is not complete. I mean, I think um, that gets a little bit to some of the stuff Doug was showing that um, uh, in some cases, someone can be functionally paralyzed, but there can still be a lot of uh, remaining uh, motor cortical activity, um, sometimes even uh, making its way to the periphery. But what if the, the stroke is in the speech area, for example, if you're trying to get That's true, if it's, if it's upstream, if it's upstream of the motor area, if, or if someone has aphasia, um, even like receptive aphasia, then you're not going to be able to uh, cure it just by connecting them. Yeah. So you talked about using these microwires to gather signals. Is there any way they can be used to deliver signal, uh, distal to a severed cord or something? Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, we see that already with the Utah Ray. People are using it. Um, our device form factor is not that much different than what like Second Sight is using. Right. Um, we're sure. just trying to push the density and push the information throughput. Sure, sure. Fantastic. Any other questions? All right, incredible progress, incredible science. Thank you so much.